Welcome to part 3, let's get right into it with Guardians of the Galaxy 2. This is the best entry so far because it has Taserface. This is the quintessential perfect villain. I think the reasons why are obvious, so we'll just move right along. Also in this film is Ego, the living planet. All around, this guy was just okay. Not bad, but not particularly great. The reveal that he was Star-Lord's father made for an interesting conflict, and Kurt Russell played the role well. The main issue is that they didn't really seem to capitalize on the concept of having a living planet as a villain, and creatively, they could have done much more. Ego manifests himself into the form of a human for most of the film, which is less exciting than being a planet. When he travels, he uses a spaceship instead of floating around as a giant planet with a face. They had a chance to show us something that we've never seen before in the big screen, and they didn't really take it. Now I don't want to be too harsh here because the Guardians films are often packed full of creativity, but a missed opportunity is a missed opportunity. When the time comes to fight, he just kind of slaps at them with these CGI glowy tentacles at a slow and easy enough speed for our heroes to properly fight back against. This is a Death Star that wants to eat you. If feels like the scale of this conflict should be a little bit larger, and the power that this creature displays should be a bit more frightening. Show the planet as a whole moving, chasing down other ships, and having space battles. Could you imagine how terrifying it would be to look out your window and see this thing chasing after you? Watching him just kinda gently smush the guardians in some rocks made it feel like there really wasn't much at stake here. There was a massive gap in power between Ego and the guardians, so constructing a battle between these two forces would be an understandably difficult task. The team as a whole could have used either a power boost or some help to balance the scales a bit more. All in all, as I said, he's not that bad though, and still helped to make Guardians 2 an enjoyable film. Next up is Spider-Man Homecoming, with some mixed results. Let's start with the Vulture. This villain was pretty great. The Vulture would very often get dismissed as a joke villain, but Homecoming took him seriously and elevated the character to a higher level. He had a great balance of being relatable while still being very much hateable. Michael Keaton killed this role, and the reveal that he was the father of Peter's love interest was an unexpected plot twist that made for an interesting dynamic to watch play out. His design was was grey and a bit messy, but he was still intimidating, and he was shown to be a dangerous threat for a rookie Spider-Man. And aside from being imposing, the Vulture stands out from other villains because the film puts a lot of effort into making it clear that this guy matters, and is not just here to be the punching bag of the week. They don't make an overabundance of jokes at his expense. His complicated relationship with Peter is incredibly unique compared to other entries, and he isn't just carelessly killed off at the end. The Scorpion tease doesn't really go anywhere, but that's beside the point. The Vulture feels like an important character within this world, instead of just being an obstacle to overcome, like most of the other villains in this franchise. Now with all that praise in mind, we can't give Homecoming too much credit because they also created this abysmal adaptation of the Shocker. The character had some promise early on as he was played with a lot of personality, and had the potential to evolve into a larger threat over time. But then he just got unceremoniously killed off out of nowhere, then he got replaced by this other, far less charismatic dude, who will go on to do absolutely nothing remarkable. On top of this bizarre and reckless swap, the Shocker also has no costume whatsoever, and only one gauntlet that is far less powerful than the ones he uses in the comics. It is perplexing how they can portray one villain so well and one so horribly within the same film. And I know what some of you might be thinking. Oh, it's only Shocker. He's just a lame D-list villain, so who cares if they portray him poorly? If this is you, get the heck out of my channel. Because in this part of town, we like the Shocker and want to see this character get treated with respect. Plus, you could argue that Vulture is also a lame D-list villain, but look at how great they made him look instead. After Homecoming, we're on to Thor Ragnarok, and oh boy. This one is complicated. We open the film with Thor confronting the fire demon Surtur. He then makes a joke out of said fire demon and defeats him easily. We'll come back to this guy later. Loki is also returning in this film, but he hardly counts as a villain at this stage. He starts out by impersonating Odin and acting as the hidden ruler of Asgard, but Thor figures out his scheme immediately and the revelation is played out as a joke. Then for the rest of the film, Loki is treated as this sassy but well-meaning rascal of a brother, instead of the psychotic, murderous madman that he used to be in films prior. All is forgiven so we're just gonna brush all that other stuff under the rug. The idea that Loki played with Thor's emotions and made him think that he died a hero just so he could sneak his way into replacing Odin and ruling Asgard was a sinister and tragic setup to the next great chapter in their dramatic rivalry. But fuck it, let's just tell some jokes instead. He still never uses his powers to their full potential because who needs the magic of the gods when you have a knife? Also in this film is the Grand Master, the brother of the Collector, who we touched on earlier. This is a very fun villain in the comics, because he's essentially a powerful being who finds amusement in playing games with people's lives. Meaning, whenever he's at odds with Marvel's heroes, he will resolve conflicts with them by making them endure bizarre games that he will have fun watching. Doing things such as making them fight in death matches, or having them search for hidden bombs throughout the galaxy, and he has the power to restore life to beings after they die. So his storylines often make for great one-off adventures, that make these high-stakes, death-heavy contests that can get neatly wrapped up in the end and reset as if nothing happened. As he appears in Ragnarok, he's a little different. Instead of being a member of 
of a powerful alien race, he seems to more so just be a normal human that just happens to be living on another planet. And instead of playing these cosmic games, he seems to just be taking the place of the Red King. For those who are unaware, the Red King has little to nothing to do with Thor, as he is one of the main antagonists in the Planet Hulk storyline. He is a ruthless tyrant who rules over his planet of slaves and gladiators, and forces the Hulk to fight for his entertainment when the Hulk crash lands on his planet. The Ragnarok film integrates many elements of Planet Hulk into its own storyline, but it wears that comic like an unflattering skin suit, more so than making a faithful adaptation out of it. The Grand Master himself pretty much just gets a glorified cameo in this film. He has no drawn out rivalry with either Thor or the Hulk, with them subtly growing in strength, from gladiators to champions to revolutionaries. These two, instead, inadvertently cause the Grand Master's downfall, simply by pursuing their own goals of escaping. Instead of headlining a multi-film Planet Hulk story arc, the Grand Master and by extension the Red King storylines get reduced to a B-plot, one that is filled to the brim with crappy jokes, and one that resolves itself without much intervention from the heroes. They completely waste the potential of two great villains for the price of one, for no good reason, with no good trade-off, and with no good payoff. All we get from this monkey circus of a story is a couple of cheap member berries, and name drops from the comics that only serve to remind us that better stories exist elsewhere, and that we are wasting our time watching this movie. Who wants to adapt some of Marvel's greatest stories to the big screen, when we could go for the easy joke instead? Speaking of, we'll talk about the executioner in a moment. But first, let's cover Hela. She's a bit tough to unpack because her portrayal in this film borrows elements from several different origins. The comic Hela is fairly different as far as personality goes. For starters, she was the alleged daughter of Loki, not Odin. She's more of a neutral figure, who only seeks to control souls of the undead, and finds the souls of Thor and Odin to be particularly desirable. However, she's also fairly honorable, and generally won't steal a soul like Thor's if she feels that he is good and deserving of a longer life. She will often be at odds with Marvel's heroes due to her desire to collect souls, and even though Loki is her father, she won't hesitate to get into a confrontation with him if they have conflicting interests. The film tweaks her to have a more deliberately evil and antagonistic role, which isn't necessarily a bad thing and works well within the story, though it does leave her feeling a bit flatter and less nuanced than she would be normally. That goes for her powers as well, as she traditionally has a wide variety of magic abilities, mainly dealing with necromancy, that allow her to be a more passive villain that rarely fights people hand to hand. In the film, she seems to mostly be reliant on these odd, albeit interesting knife spawning powers. I don't know why the MCU associates as guardians with knives so much, but here we are. One major point of praise is her design. It's just great, and that can honestly extend to pretty much every character in this film, except Meek. The villains in particular each have their own bright, standout costumes that make them memorable and easily identifiable, even if they aren't on screen for a very long time. They also happen to be fairly comic accurate, which is always appreciated. The one slightly disappointing element to Hell's design is that her comic self is half dead and needs to constantly wear a cloak to preserve her beauty and power. If the cloak is removed, she will be weakened and half her body will decay. The half dead element to her character is not present in the film and would have been fascinating to see in live action. Regardless, her black and green aesthetic is both eerie and eye catching, and the way she puts on her helmet makes for a good lasting impression. All around, Hela is pretty decently used in this movie. She looks great and accomplishes a lot in terms of ruining our hero's life. It's unfortunate though that her downfall came at the hands of Surtur and not Thor himself. Hela is the villain that had taken the most from Thor up to this point. She killed his friends, destroyed his hammer, and drove him out of his home. Yet he was never truly able to inflict his own justice upon her, and had to let someone else do it. Though one could argue that the Surtur reveal was a fun subversion, and a nice shakeup from the typical final battle. That said, the use of Surtur in this film was underwhelming to say the least. Like Dormammu, Ultron, and Thanos, the presence of this guy within Marvel is meant to be a big deal. For any Teen Titan fans out there that know about Trigon, well he's a lot like that. His role in this film is to bring about the destruction of Asgard, yet he's treated like a funny plot device. The film opens by making him into a foolish joke that gets slapped around. If you want people to not care about your villains, this is a textbook way to do it. Then when he returns at full power, he is still foolish and can't seem to realize that he is wasting his time destroying an Asgard that is completely empty. He is still not taken seriously as more jokes are constantly thrown around in his presence, aside from this one shot of sad faces. Aww. Then the dude just ends up killing himself for some random reason while he takes out Hela and Asgard. It sure would have been inconvenient if he had survived that and had the ability to continue doing evil things, such as pursuing the Asgardians to Earth. That totally wouldn't make for an exciting movie or anything. No, who wants to do that when we can subvert expectations in hilarious fashion? Moving on from Thor, next up we have... Oh wait, 
there's still this guy, and he comes with his own special can of worms. Scourge, the Executioner, the ultimate simp of the Marvel Universe. This guy plays a similar role in the comics as he does in the films, in that he betrays Asgard in order to serve his master by being her muscle and doing her dirty work so she doesn't have to lift a finger. Only unlike in the comics, the MCU Executioner is much smaller, weaker, stupider, and far more useless than his original self, to the point where he does next to nothing of value in this film, aside from having an oddly placed Doom reference in his death scene. Honestly, all all he really does in this film is trail behind Hela looking sad. Even during moments like this, we would expect Hela to delegate this sort of work to someone else. Like, if not even to do jobs like this, why even have this guy around? There's also one other very notable difference that comes with this character. You see, in the comics, the Executioner doesn't serve Hela, he serves the Enchantress. Let's do something fun. No, not that clown. This one. And she has been glaringly missing from the entirety of the MCU. She is probably one of the most popular villains that Marvel has never adapted to film yet. And considering her executioner has already come and gone, her chances of showing up at this point are slim to none. And it's really unfortunate because her character has been involved in dozens of great Marvel storylines. Throughout all of Loki's many schemes, she tags along in a massive amount of them. In the last video, we talked about Baron Zemo and the Masters of Evil, and she was a key member of that group. She is one of the most consistently reoccurring villains that Marvel has to offer and has crossed paths with many other heroes and villains alike. So it's bizarre that she would be completely absent from a production like the MCU, especially within the Thor films. What's even more bizarre is her absence in light of the MCU's more recent agenda of pushing more diverse characters to the forefront. One would think that the Enchantress would be a great candidate to introduce at this time, because her main power is to force men to fall in love with her and serve her every command. She is also a nuanced character who, like Loki, often dreams of either ruling or destroying Asgard, yet she also has a genuine love for Thor, and that complicates her conviction to her villainous goals. This is a character that should have been there from day one, as she could have been relevant throughout the entirety of the MCU's development, from the Thor films, to the Avengers, to Civil War, and so on. Like, how are you gonna have a movie called Love and Thunder, but discard the character that can weaponize love? Severely missed opportunity. They brought in her whipping boy, yet she doesn't even get so much as a name drop. Thor Ragnarok as a whole had a decent main antagonist, but one that was surrounded by a plethora of turd-like side villains, one of which only serves to remind you of better villains that never came around. That'll be it for part three as I'm trying to make these videos shorter in order to release them more frequently. We didn't get that deep within the MCU this time, but that's only because there was so much to talk about in the movies we covered. At this point, you may start to notice some patterns in where these villains went wrong versus the ones they got right. Very often, the bad eggs include a crappy design. They will have a bland personality. They will often be a knockoff of the hero. They will be used as punchlines for many tone-deaf jokes, and they will often accomplish very little in the short time that they are around before being abruptly killed off, and their impact on the MCU as a whole will be so minuscule that it will hardly be worth the effort to try and remember. The villains that leave the best impressions often have great designs, often last for more than one film, and while they are on screen, they will often be able to actually get a lot done, and have a lasting impact on the larger story, even after they are no longer around. Now I feel like I'm not being taken seriously when I say like and subscribe or else I'm making Spy Kids videos instead. Don't think that won't happen. IDGAF. I will drop part 4 with zero hesitation if the numbers for part 3 aren't satisfying. You've been thoroughly warned.